The scripture reading for this morning is taken from the work, excuse me, James, chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by men. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's image and likeness. Out, out of the same mouths come praise and cursing. My brothers, this shall not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Lord. Well, that scripture brings us to the third week in a five-week uh, series on the book of James. And I'm going to encourage you to open up to James. So if you have it on your phone, if you have a Bible app on your phone, if you have a paper Bible, we have one in front of you. I just feel like it's better if we're looking at the same thing together and you're thinking as well as I'm thinking and this is something we do together. Not so we can show off and all have our Bibles open, but uh, we can be working on God's Word together. So if you're new to the Bible, you don't know where James is, then here's a chart of the New Testament. So the second part of the Bible, the New Testament, and James is kind of towards the back. It's a collection of books that are called the General Epistles. All of them are wonderful, and James kind of is my favorite in this section because he is so practical. He speaks directly to Christians and gets real with them and says, this is how you put your faith into action. This is how you live out your faith in your everyday lives. I really like what he gives us. And specifically, he is saying, I have five ways that you can prove it. So if you're a Christian and you want to prove it to yourself and you want to prove it to other people so they will know that's, that you are who you say you are, then do these five things. And here they are. Next, there we go. You replace anger with action. Number one, you're able to replace anger with action. Two, you treat everyone the same. Third, you tame your tongue. You've learned how to do that. Four, you keep yourself humble. And fifth, you are able to focus on being content and generous. Both content and generous. And so James, I think, is saying, focus on those five things. And other people will say, yes, not only does he say... He's a Christian. He acts like it. People will just sense the integrity of your faith. So we're looking at all five of these, one a week, and we come to taming your tongue. And who better to go to for wisdom on how to tame your tongue, hold your tongue, think before you speak, than mom? Mother's Day wisdom on how to tame your tongue. I, I went out and I found some, some mom-isms to share with children and whoever needs a mom wisdom. And so here's one of them. The things you say about others say a lot about you. Ever heard that one? What you say about others says more about you than it does them. Have long ears and a short tongue, which seems weird to me. It's like Pinocchio, long ears, what's that all about? I think it means to listen more than you speak. And then here's one, be sure to taste your words before you spit them out. Okay, that was a graphic. Be careful with your words. They can only be forgiven, not forgotten. Mm. 
And then last, man, this one cuts. It cuts deep. Moms have a way of doing that sometimes, right? They just zinger right to it. Your tongue has no bones, but is strong enough to break a heart. Mm -hmm. Anybody feeling really guilty yet? Yeah, okay. Here's one that does not come from moms, but I hear it all the time. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but does any, am I the only one that knows this? But words can never hurt me. Lie. It's obvious that does not come from a mom because that is a lie. I think moms would be the first to say that is not true. Words hurt my little babies. I don't want any hurtful words around. Words can do damage. I can speak to you from experience that um, when I have received criticism, when there's been name-calling, when I have been bullied, uh, when I've been browbeaten or berated or uh, I have been rejected, it has hurt me. It has changed me so that I have more walls around my heart. People's words have, have done that to me. How about you? And um, I have to admit that every single day I live with at least some fear that right around the corner there are more hateful words or more hard-hurting words coming my way. And every single day I bear more than a little shame for the way my words have hurt others and have done damage in other people's lives. I know that they have. And, um, and I, I struggle with that, um, with that burden. And, um, and so um, that's just kind of an everyday thing. And so I just got to ask you, what about you? Have you experienced the hurt of other people's words and do you also know that your words have hurt, have hurt others? So we're going to go to the book of James. And uh, I'm going to get you a little bit earlier than what was read for you, the verses 3 through 6. So take a look at that. And what you will notice is that there are some word pictures going on. The first thing is uh, the description of a bridal. Anybody know what a bridal is? Do we have any equestrians here? Okay, so the, right, the bit that goes into the mouth um, that you use to steer a horse. And I, I'm sure that's, there's a better way to put that, but that's essentially what it is, right? Um, so that's the first one. The second one he uses is the rudder of a boat. So that's the, the little flap at the back of a boat that can be turned to, to steer the boat. Third word picture is a spark or a small bit of flame that when put in contact with a dried out forest can engulf the whole forest in fire. <coughs> Excuse me. So in each of these examples, it's no, notice this. In each of these examples, James is describing something that's relatively small. A, a bit, a rudder, and a spark, at least compared to the size of the thing that it's coming in contact with. However, that small thing has enormous power. It can steer, it can change, it can transform that which it is connected to. The whole thing, right? James is saying the same is true for our words. Words seem to us to be pretty insignificant. They're just letters. Okay, so words are like that. Words seem small, seem insignificant. We gather them up into sentences. We're using them all the time for a variety of things. But when they come in contact with our lives, when they come in contact with our relationships, when they come in contact with our jobs and our vocations, they can make a tremendous difference, can't they? They can really shape impact, change, all of those things, even though they're such a small thing. 
Then also, if you skip ahead to verses 11 and 12, <clears throat> more word pictures. James talks about uh, fresh water and salt water, seawater, coming out of the same well, mixing, in other words, together. And then he talks about different types of trees bearing <clears throat> different kinds of fruit. So, while I'm sipping, how does that relate to words? <clears throat> when we have double talk, <clears throat> when we're inconsistent in our words, and, uh, okay, everybody take a deep breath with me. Okay. So when <clears throat> our words get mixed up and we say things that are inconsistent with other things we've said or things that we have done, then what that can do is create mistrust. It can make it so that our relationships and our communication with people is kept really shallow because people don't feel like they can go any deeper with us. So that's, that's a hindrance on our ability to connect with each other. So James is saying in both of those, with all of those word pictures, words are powerful, and if they are not connected to that which we really are and that which we believe, then it will keep us from doing the work that God has called us to do. <clears throat> but we don't want to forget the first two verses in this passage. And that is, go take a look at those real quick. Who is he talking to? So this whole conversation that he's having, who is he talking to? It says there right off the bat. Anyone want to shout it out? Huh? Teachers. What kind of teachers? Elementary school, driver's ed, college professors, who are we talking about? Linda? Yeah. Church teachers, yeah. Yeah. Bible teachers, preachers, wah, wah. Anybody who is in a position of leadership over a church and whose words guide that church, teach that church what it is to be a Christian, yeah, James is saying... Uh, this is relevant for the church. The words that we say have incredible power, spiritual power over other people. And notice also as you look through these verses that you'll find the word body mentioned several times. Maybe as many as four times in some translations. You see the word body. So that Greek word soma is often used in the New Testament church as a metaphor for uh, an illustration for the church, the body of Christ. James is saying here that if you want proof that we need to tame our tongues, and that's a prove it for our faith, then look no further than the church. Because some of you may know of churches that are incredibly healthy. And one of the things that makes them healthy is when they speak to each other, they speak words that are edifying, that build each other up, that are helpful to each other. But some of you may know of other churches where it is toxic. And words are used to destroy and belittle and judge and condemn, and you can see the destructive power of words in the church. So James is basically saying, look no further than what we got right here to know how important it is to tame our tongue. The Bible says pretty consistently, folks, that our words reflect what's going on inside of us. Our words are like a spiritual barometer which reveal the level of our maturity in our faith. 
Um, I got some scriptures to prove it, I think. This is what Jesus himself says. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. That's what defiles a person. Uh, This is Paul, the Apostle Paul, in Romans. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And James himself says a little bit earlier in his book, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, that person's religion is worthless. Because what you say says a lot about what's going on inside of you. If you are angry inside of you, then chances are your words are going to have an edge to them when they come out. If you are annoyed inside of you, then your words are probably going to be pretty snarky, pretty sarcastic when they come out. If you are afraid, then your words will be tentative. If you are sad, then your words may be a little dark. If you are questioning, (coughs) then your words will be um, full of doubt. If you are excited, your words will be rapid fire, right? You always know when somebody's excited. "Ah, I'm so excited. If you are happy, then your words will glow. All these things reflect what's going on inside. And I know that each of us knows somebody who thinks They got it down, the silent types, right, the Stoics, the ones who rarely speak, the ones who are very guarded about what they say, you know, they don't, they just kind of hang back, but you know, that says something, doesn't it, about being so vague and being so detached says something about what's going on inside of them. And people that always seem to be so polished in what they say. Almost as if they rehearse everything they say. That says something, right? About what's going on inside of them. So what do we do? My my friends, my fellow Christians, James, please tell us what are we supposed to do? And the answer that we get, if you look at verse 8, it looks like there is no answer. This is kind of a problem. He's introducing this is such a big deal for Christians, but he says Christians can't do anything about it. He says, you can't tame the tongue. Can't be done. It's just too wild. It's too, it's, it, it's not, it's not, it's not in our capability to tame the tongue. We're just kind of going, well, why are we even having this discussion? Well, notice how he says it. He actually is very optimistic, folks, about how, about our ability to tame our tongue. So he's very optimistic. And you can see it in his words if you just read between the lines. He says, Look at it. No human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. Anybody know what he's really saying? If you know it, shout it out. God can. You can't. But God definitely can. And he will. And, in fact, he already has through the cross of Jesus. Submitting ourselves to God will give us the power to tame our tongues. God is so, so willing to do that for you, folks. Um, He is so ready uh, to do that for me. He is so ready to do that for you. You don't have to run everything by God. You're, You're talking all the time. You don't have to check everything that comes out of your mouth by God. But I would say that there are two things that you want to be checking in, you want to be prayerful about before you open your mouth and speak. The first is whenever you're talking to somebody else. I almost amended that earlier this morning and said, well, you know, but not with small talk. And then I changed my mind. Even with small talk, check yourself. Get connected with God before you speak. And the second thing, this might be even more important, that internal conversation that you have, 
Every time you're rehearsing what you want to say, whether you say it or not, right? That kind of grumbling that goes on inside of you, and I'm going to give them a piece of my mind, kind of talking. Check that with God, too. James makes it very easy. He says, always praise God instead of cursing others. Praise God instead of cursing others. It's not really a binary. In other words, you're not making a choice between two things. You're really only choosing one thing, and that's praising God. Because those who sort of say, okay, I'm not going to curse others. I'm going to praise God. Then what they do is they say, God, I praise you that you're sending them to hell. <laughs> or some words to that effect. You want the praising of God to be so much of what's going on inside of you that the cursing has no room. It is pushed out. Instead, moms, moms, when your kid, I'm sure you two are wonderful, you are never annoying to your mom. I'm sure, I'm sure you are never annoying. Yes, you right there. You are never annoying. You are never annoying to your mom at all. But if, if you were, then your mom's filled with the Holy Spirit, have the chance to pray, Lord, my kid is annoying me right now. I'm going to be honest about it. But I also praise you, God, because you've given me incredible opportunity to be a shepherd to my children, to, to guide them, to communicate your truth, to lead them into your presence God, let this be an opportunity for me, a wonderful opportunity to be encouraging to my children. And Lord, please just take away that temptation to want to get back at them for how annoying they are to me right now. And then finally, this is just to Oakland Presbyterian Church, my, my, my OPC friends. But frankly, if you're a member of another church, it applies to that church too. This is the place where we learn how to talk with each other. We're not expected to get it perfectly, but if our communication is starting to get gossipy or bossy or judgmental or belittling, we must help each other out and, and say something. Say, hey, folks, James told us what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be taming our tongue and, and encourage each other to use words that build each other up and to affirm each other. If, there, if our speech with each other is getting off track, we got to say something. And we got to help each other to get back on track. Otherwise, it can be incredibly destructive to any new people that God sends our way. Okay? Okay? So let me pray you through this, pray myself through it too, in whatever way that you like to pray, just uh, close your eyes or fold your hands, whatever makes sense to you, but Lord, I pray first that you would shine a light on our tongues right now and the way our, our speech has been used in the past. Help us to see those times that we have really been helpful. When we have been encouraging, our words have made a positive difference in other people's lives. We praise you and we thank you that you gave us that incredible impact on others. What a, what a gift. What a joy. But Lord, also you can probably shine a light on the times that our, our words have been hurtful. They have been critical. They have been hypocritical. They have belittled others so that we can build ourselves up. Our words were well-intentioned, but they missed the mark. Lord, in the midst of this, we give you our speech. We hand it over to you, and we ask that you would heal it, especially when we talk to other people, and especially when we talk to ourselves. Lord, direct our speech into praising you. Direct our speech away from cursing others. 
And Lord, especially in this church, we pray that you would build us up. Make us strong in the faith so we can encourage each other. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.